Chapter 17, Urban Permaculture. Cities generate and trap heat and seal off bare ground with impermeable surfaces. They mismanage their resources of water, waste streams, and potential energy. Cities are, however, attracting an ever greater proportion of our human population as their preferred habitat. This is clustering human populations like never before, and this focusing of human populations may help take the stress off of rural landscapes. Cities offer the convenience of clustered services, resources, employment, education, and cross-cultural diversity in venues. And cities also provide nexus points for trade and exchange. Applying permacultural thinking to urban systems is generating tremendous new market opportunities for effective solutions, but widespread and large-scale adoption has yet to occur. When it does, the effects will be dramatic. Cities from their inception were microclimates interspersed with smaller microclimates inside them, often parkland, wind tunnels, still areas, or cooling water surfaces. And our megacities of today still offer many features that can be directed to work towards sustainability. Concrete planters can be built on top of the ever-present concrete. The concrete and blacktop can be painted white and shaded to retain the cooler temperatures of the night instead of the hotter temperatures of the day. More easily incorporated into design of new buildings, green roofs are becoming important heat absorption and water retention elements. All the organic matter in the waste streams of the cities can be repurposed to create energy, soil, and more food. There are also numerous sheltered areas in these urban spaces that can be used for growing daylight sensitive plants or fungi. Through a windbreak can shelter tender plants or seedlings. These sheltered areas can provide habitat for ponds or other ecosystems that extend and magnify the cooling effects. Greening the city with biological solutions to mechanically created problems is possible, and it is already occurring with the highest yields per square foot found in urban gardens, where soil is often scarce but resources many, though more than the food systems of the cities must change. Urban wastewater. The way toilets are constructed and waste is handled must change drastically. The toilet must only be used for urine and manure, and both need to be separate from each other. Toilets designed for this are available, and there are historic examples as well. Urine can be used at low concentration on plants as a fertilizer because it contains many important nutrients. Urine is also used as a fungicide at a higher concentration because of the ammonia it contains. Humanure from healthy individuals can be processed in a hot compost. Humanure can also be processed for a minimum of three months in a biodigester, biogas system, composting system, or even outhouse pit, but examine and test the final product always as it has many variables. Human waste is an end result of food grown in soil. All of these could be resources used by city administrators in green spaces, street planners, community food gardens, and more. Natural cycle principles hold that animals that consume a plant will pass the waste from digesting that plant along to the soil food web, either close to that plant to nourish it or farther from that plant to spread the plant's genetics. If our soils are to be sustainable and regenerative, they must be built on and be part of the whole cycle of soil. From food to digestion to waste to the soil and back again to the food, restoring the cycle that never should have been broken in Western agriculture. It wasn't in most Asian agriculture. In China, it is called night soil. In Britain, they have used the biogas from sewage for cooking and heating. It is not just human waste that needs to be put back into the proper cycle, but also all waste water. Mitigation ideas. Gray water from showers, sinks, and washing machines needs to be used widely. It can't be drained into the ocean after one usage, as has been the practice in many areas, such as Los Angeles. Water falling in and on skyscrapers has to be leveraged to generate energy, filtered in place with gravel, ceramic clay, carbon, and sand filters, and it has to be used to water vegetation or reused on site. Reed beds at the bases of buildings can filter water further, allowing it to be recycled for watering or even human use if clean enough. Energy generated from falling water within buildings can be used to pump water back up to the top of the system. Rainwater and gray water can be focused into larger catchment and lower buildings for power generation. Any excess energy generated can charge the building's main batteries or be put to some other use. 
adding in air as the water falls at any point can increase both water and air pressure. Depending on how buildings are designed, they can save energy and store it. Vines that shade the roof can lower the temperatures in top floors of buildings in summers. Climbing vines like hardy kiwi fruit growing from the bottom story up allow folks to vacation without having to worry about watering. They also provide shade, privacy, food, cooling, air filtration, and oxygen. Vertical gardens can be installed on balconies as well as bag gardens hanging inside and outside the apartments wherever there is space. Rooftop gardens with light soil mixes to keep pressure off the roofs and trellises above them to further shade the roof from the sun's direct rays help further insulate buildings from high summer temperatures. These areas also clean and filter the rainfall and air while mitigating overall consumption of resources. People stay at home more, grow their own food, heat and cool their home less, and enjoy better health and therefore consume fewer medicines. Sidewalks, many roadways, and any pointless concrete need to be removed and perennial edible shading and ground cover plants need to be put in place. Regardless of where you live, greening the urban landscape is the only way to make cities sustainable and ideally regenerative. Any space like curb strips or front lawns can be productive and yield food in other products. Rainwater catchment has to be encouraged from the home scale to the municipal. If we funnel all the rainwater to a municipal site for it to be cleaned in return, that represents an enormous amount of energy. To prevent water intake from being too great at any one time for the city system, all home systems need to catch rainwater and store it wherever they can. From a rain barrel to a 5,000 gallon tank to a concrete buried cistern, all the spaces we can get are needed to catch all the water that passes over the urban hardscape. City streets, sidewalks, and parks can all be places of water catchment. Swales, earthworks, and careful catchment can happen everywhere. Many cities like Phoenix and Los Angeles, thought to be parched, actually receive enough rainfall annually to match most, if not all, their water needs. If water is recycled, reused, and sunk into the landscape, there will soon be an abundance that translates into improvements in other areas, socioeconomically and health-wise. The desertification of our lands and urban areas keenly affects the local economies as well. All the water that falls on concrete should be slowed, spread, soaked, and stored for later use. Empty underground car garages can be cleaned, sealed, and used to raise fish and aquatic plants in an aerated system, or they can even be turned into giant aquaponic systems with the fish in a lower lot and the plants on the lot above in stacked shelves of flooded plant trays like Will Allen's greenhouse farms in Milwaukee on a giant scale. His system is creating 10,000 pounds, four and a half thousand kilograms of food on a quarter of an acre, which is a thousand square meters. So imagine what a system the size of a city block could generate. Or even imagine if the water were routed through the sidewalk hydroponic growing beds that double as street corner farm stands for fresh food. You could buy your dinner's fresh greens off the street fed by rainwater and fish manure. You could likely even buy a delectable carp for dinner that fed your Swiss shard and in turn the Swiss shard cleaned the water for that fish. It, it could be all part of your own apartment complex's design. And as part of your rent, you get a certain amount of fresh produce and fish for free or at a discount. Chickens, ducks, rabbits, or any animal that can develop fully while in confinement are good choices for urban environments. Chickens can be noisy, but good design can muffle a rooster in a straw bale coop and bell dome. Rabbits are always quiet and create over 100 pounds, 45 kilograms of meat per mature rabbit doe per year. Ducks, quail, and chickens can even feed on rabbit manure as well as the worms and soil life that develops in the composting rabbit manure. Birds can be kept below rabbits with wire cages that allow their manure to fall through. All organic matter is composted either as part of a home, apartment, neighborhood, block, or municipal system. All paper, woody waste, and cardboard is first inoculated with mushroom mycelium, then vermicomposted to worm castings for parks, gardens, and compost teas. These can be free or sold cheaply to keep the nutrients and waste cycling. Food in turn would become continuously cheaper and more widely available with more choices as soils build and plant offerings increase, all of which sequester carbon dioxide in the landscape itself. Energy Solutions Falling water, trapped heat, the sun's light, wind tunnels, and decomposition are all available resources for energy solutions in an urban area. Sun, water, and wind. 
All urban surfaces facing the sun path can be leveraged to capture the sun's rays in solar panels and stored in batteries, hydrogen, lithium, ion, nickel, iron, that powers buildings, streetlights, the local communication grid, and local municipal transportation. Many large international cities are positioned near coastlines with tidal activity that can be leveraged for consistent power generation. Large strategic wind turbines are used to power many parts of the European Union. Renewable energies of this kind are key to replacing the fossil fuel-based energy economy. They are continuously lowering the cost and increasing efficiency, and soon the renewable energy resources will be unstoppable on the market. Widespread adoption of clean energy technologies are around the corner. How fast and how deeply we adopt renewable energy is up to us. Apartment and Municipal Scale Tromps Built for Peter the Great Peterhof Palace outside St. Petersburg boasts elaborate fountains that perform sophisticated water performances perpetually with nothing but water pressure, very similar to a tromp. In Canada, a municipal tromp, the air plant mentioned in the Alternative Energy chapter, was in operation for over 70 years. The engineering to create tromps has been with us for centuries but not implemented widely. Tromp systems that run large turbines with only compressed air and with little if any maintenance are the future of passively harvested energy for any city with a considerable body of moving water nearby. Apartment, homestead, and municipal tromps can all generate and store electricity passively as well as use that cooled air and collected water for other purposes. Rocket Stove Turbines Since stick fires in a rocket stove, J-Tube easily give us clean burning heat, we can apply rocket stove technology to the classic turbine system steam, or even a Stirling engine. Commonly a serious concern in creating hot water systems with a rocket stove, steam can be deadly in almost any situation. Putting it under pressure is even more deadly, so precision and caution are needed in design. In spite of the associated danger, rocket stove turbines offer the cleanest, most regenerative and sustainable renewable energy source available for generating electricity where woody or combustible biomass is available. Municipal steam turbines already exist, and are used in nuclear waste burning and coal burning power plants, among others. We just have to design a rocket stove system that can replace these other heat sources in place, making the least amount of change for the greatest effect. Rocket stoves have also been recently found by researchers Erica and Ernie Wisner to be able to burn plastic cleanly. In addition, the Wisners have been able to burn wood at nearly the full BTU of wood itself, which is 4,000 degrees, 2,204 degrees Celsius. That means we could burn our trash at home inside and have it burn cleanly, power the lights in the kitchen, warm the floors or walls, and then feed in a closed loop to an algae pool that feeds into a biofuel system, becomes a soil amendment, or feeds fish. The possibilities are endless. Solar and thermal walls and windows. Using the greenhouse effect, we can trap heat in chambers attached to the outside of buildings like a facade or siding and let the air flow into the building for heat. Similarly, we can cover the sun path facing walls and buildings faces to have solar panels embedded in them. There are numerous ways we can draw on heat and capture solar energy in our architecture. Transportation. Mass transit is possible in a city that can leverage its waste to power it. It can save energy by helping large amounts of people move all at once. Otherwise, all vehicles can be pedal powered with battery backups like the Rat Racer or the Pod Ride, which is strictly pedal powered. Both are engineered to enhance the pedal power of the driver to make it easy to pedal up hills and over long distances. Pedal powered vehicles are lighter, smaller, and slower than gasoline and diesel powered vehicles. These vehicles are safer, healthier, and have zero emissions. They also encourage local healthy living. Longer trips can rely upon mass transit or enhanced pedal vehicles. In time, these innovative designs will improve even more as they are adopted widely and new complexities will also arise to further adapt their designs to the new needs. Flight will likewise be adapted to use batteries, solar power, and gliding aircraft where possible. Gliders can fly for five hours after being towed to altitude and speed by a biofuel or solar powered plane. Many current efforts in flight are focused around a solar powered drone designed to stay in flight perpetually. The first day-night solar-powered flight successfully occurred in 2005, with more recently the Atlantic Solar UAV unmanned aerial vehicle in 2015 breaking the flight endurance world record for all aircrafts, over 50 kilograms total mass. 
Nearly a thousand kilometers, 629 miles of highway in France are being turned into large solar panels themselves. Sweden is creating an electric highway using the technology used for electric trains, only with trucks, and sourcing the electricity from alternative energy sources. Electric vehicles have taken off all over the world, but not everywhere is using clean electricity. Many are using fossil fuels or nuclear power to recharge their electric cars, trucks, and buses. As gas prices rise, these vehicles will begin to dominate the market. Already diesel vehicles and repair shops are becoming a rare sight as clean energy technology and engineering become more prominent in the highest levels of academia and prevalent in the market. On top of all this innovation, we have a growing culture of sharing. We'd rather share bikes and cars than own them in many cases. Uber is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer car service where users can ride Uber vehicles when needed or drive Uber vehicles to earn money. Bike share programs are popping up in cities all over the world. And even further, driverless technologies are being adopted and tested everywhere. Self-driving cars that plug into decentralized solar, wind, and micro-hydro power grids are the future in many places. The Edo Period at the start of the Edo period in Japan, 1600s to 1800s, there was deforestation over population with densities greater than modern Tokyo and a growing waste problem. But Japan overcame and reversed these trends using permaculture thinking and techniques. Within a generation, the people adopted what they called multi-form solutions that helped people, the environment, and the future. This concept mirrors stacking functions. By using less, reusing, and recycling, the Japanese were able to live on their islands in isolation and refuse trade with Westerners. They built small homes with small rooms. They had tinkerers, pottery healers, and buyers, as well as purveyors of nearly every kind of waste, from paper to ash to manure. They used latrines or earth pit toilets that were used to compost the human manure in an advanced fertilization program where individuals sold their human manure on the free market and the compost was later sold to farmers. Vegetarian homes sold their manure at a higher price point. It had less nitrogen and so needed less carbon to compost so it meant less work and input of resources to fully compost. In order to use less fuel, clay pots of water were warmed in the sun before being heated to make tea. Considered a plant-based or agricultural country, Japan in the Edo period exemplified a culture staying within its allotted annual solar energy budget. They didn't use anything outside their system and they avoided anything degenerative. Malmo, Sweden. The third largest city in Sweden and home to more than 300,000 people, Malmo is leading its country in renewable energy generation. The Western Harbor section has an ingenious heating and cooling system that uses summer warmed water to heat the area in winter and winter cooled water to cool the area in summer. They use cisterns 90 meters, 295 feet below the city to hold the water and they use wind-powered electricity to pump it in and out of the cisterns. Over the course of a year, over 5 million kilowatts of heat and 3 million kilowatts of cooling is produced. 25% of all travel in Malmo is done by bicycle. The city fosters a bike culture by showing preference for bikes in road design with raised bike paths and providing free bike parking by encouraging carpooling and car sharing by keeping parking to the edges of the community, car rolls are minimized and therefore they are used minimally. Green roofs are widely used in the Augustenburg section of town. Over 9,000 square meters, 29, 500,000 square feet were installed after an initiative was begun to prevent flooding in the area. Before green roofs, they initially diverted the stormwater into ponds and canals. The roofs, clean the air and water as well. While all government buildings are powered by renewable hydroelectric power, the largest offshore wind farm in Sweden is just outside Malmo. The 48 turbines provide enough electricity for 60,000 homes, a large portion of the population. Fast becoming a place to visit and study, Malmo is researching and testing out many different new designs and technologies to reach their goal of being 100% renewable by 2030. The Brooklyn Grange Farm. Using marginal spaces in cities is how urban farming is making fast inroads in city markets. Rooftops are a natural choice in places like New York City with little green space. 
occupying two rooftops covering 2.5 acres, one hectare. The Grange has taken urban gardening to new heights. Using a green roof design that is waterproof and lightweight, soil and moisture are held in place. This new system of growing food has interesting advantages. There are no large browsers like deer to worry about, and there is less air pollution. The particulates are too heavy to reach them. The farm operates a modest CSA program providing members with seasonal fresh clean food, though most of their produce is sold wholesale directly to restaurants. Similar to Curtis Stone's business model featured in the Permaculture in Action chapter. They adhere to organic principles but eschew the USDA certification. The Grange was also the first and currently is the largest commercial bee farm in New York City. They also teach urban beekeeping, sell honey, offer design and installation services, and put on public events. In a city of 8 million people, they are a leading example of growing food in the concrete jungle.